I'm Paul Levinson, and welcome to Light on Light Through, episode 367, my review of the Who Killed JFK podcast with Rob Reiner and Soledad O'Brien, episode 6 through 8. And, well, episode six really hit pay dirt with an account of Richard Case Nagel. In fact, I think of this episode as the Richard Case Nagel case. That account was given to Dick Russell. And that account provides the most convincing evidence I've heard so far that Lee Harvey Oswald was indeed a patsy set up to take the fall for the assassination of JFK on November 22nd, 1963. So, who was Nagel? He was a CIA double agent, same as Oswald, according to Russell and the Who Killed JFK podcast, tasked by the Soviets, whom he wasn't really working for, to kill Oswald. So Nagel was tasked by the Soviets to kill Lee Harvey Oswald. A double agent, he was working for the CIA, but in his capacity as a double agent, he was hoping to have fooled the Soviets that he was actually their agent working for them, and they gave him the job of killing Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, why was that? Well, Rob Reiner and Dick Russell explained that the Soviets knew of the CIA plan to kill Kennedy and blame it on them, the Soviets, and use that as a pretext for the U.S. to then invade Cuba and once and for all get Castro out of power. Extensively interviewed by Russell over a period of 20 years before Nagel's death from a, quote, heart attack, unquote, in 1995, Russell tells us in this podcast, Who Killed JFK podcast, and in his 2003 book about Nagel, provocatively titled The Man Who Knew Too Much, that Nagel was ordered by the Soviets to kill Oswald to prevent, to prevent the assassination of John F. Kennedy. This put Nagel, quote, between a rock and a hard place, unquote, as Soledad O'Brien aptly puts it. If Nagel followed the Soviet orders, and if he killed Oswald, the CIA would likely kill him. If he didn't follow those orders, the Soviets would have likely done the same. That is, they would have killed Nagel. So Nagel tries to let Oswald know that he, Oswald, is being set up without being too specific because Nagel doesn't want to bring the CIA down on him. Oswald shrugs Nagel off. So in a move that seems crazy, if you don't know any of this background, Nagel walks into a bank in Dallas two months before JFK's assassination, fires a gun in the air twice because he wants to get arrested because he figures that prison is the safest place to be, with potentially CIA and Soviet assassins both out to get him, both out to kill him. And the CIA does eventually kill Nagel with a, quote, heart attack gun, unquote. This is not science fiction. Check it out online. And uh, this heart attack gun killed Nagel in 1995, one day after the Assassinations Records Review Board, established by Congress in the President Kennedy Records Collection Act of 1992. 
they sent Nagel a request for information. And fortunately for the truth, Nagel had already extensively talked with Russell in the preceding decades. So killing him didn't prevent the truth from getting out. So where does all of this leave us? Well, as I said in reviews of the earlier episodes of this Who Killed JFK podcast, really a crucial podcast to listen to, this podcast convinced me early on that at very least Lee Harvey Oswald was not the sole shooter in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. And I'm now convinced that Oswald was far more than not the only shooter that day. He was indeed the, quote, patsy, unquote, as Oswald, after the assassination, said he was. In the murder, intricately plotted and carried out by the CIA to punish JFK for his failure to provide support for the Bay of Pigs invasion, prevent JFK from furthering detente with the Soviet Union, and we can now add to provide a pretext for a U.S. all-out attack on Cuba. Let's get on to the next episode of Who Killed JFK. That would be episode seven. And let me begin my review of that episode by saying that given the depth of the pain that I and everyone I know felt about the assassination of JFK in November 1963, you know, it's hard to fathom how many different people fervently wanted that to happen. And the seventh episode of this podcast with Rob Reiner and Soledad O'Brien makes the case for three groups in particular that wanted JFK dead. And that would be the CIA, Cuban exiles, and the mafia. Now, the animus that the CIA and exiles from Castro's Cuba had for JFK was already convincingly presented in prior episodes of this path-breaking Who Killed JFK podcast. In episode seven, the focus is on the mafia, and they had two reasons to hate JFK. First, Castro's takeover of Cuba resulted in the mob's Caribbean Las Vegas. That's what the mob thought Cuba was. And Castro's takeover of Cuba resulted in the mob's Caribbean Las Vegas being extinguished. And that cost the mob untold millions of dollars. JFK's move towards peace and de facto acceptance of Castro in Cuba after the Cuban Missile Crisis thus angered the mob almost as much as it did the Cuban exiles in Miami and the bellicose CIA. Second, Robert F. Kennedy, appointed attorney general by his brother JFK, pursued an escalating attack on the mafia, giving it a reason all its own to want JFK removed from office. And as this episode amply details, members of all three groups, the CIA, Cuban exiles, and the mafia, were in Dallas the day that JFK was assassinated. Are we to believe that that was just coincidence? Not very likely. And one CIA operative in particular is especially notable, E. Howard Hunt, who achieved infamy a decade later as one of the architects of the Watergate break-in that brought down Richard Nixon. 
As Reiner aptly puts it more than once, there were lots of chess pieces being moved around in the months preceding JFK's assassination, all of which to ensure that JFK was killed and the blame was placed with none of the three groups, the CIA, the Cuban exiles, the mafia, who were, in fact, responsible. You know, the more I listen to this podcast, the more the proposition that Lee Harvey Oswald was indeed the patsy that he proclaimed himself to be right after the assassination. Well, that proposition rings ever more true. Let's go on to the eighth episode of Who Killed JFK? It was a short but powerfully informative episode that makes a convincing case that Lee Harvey Oswald couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly have even fired any of the shots on that day in Dallas. Here are some of the highlights. One, the package that Oswald carried into the Texas Book Depository on the day of the assassination, well, it was too small to fit the rifle that killed JFK, even if that weapon was disassembled, according to a witness interviewed by Reiner in 2023, who traveled with Oswald to work that day. Two, More than one witness places Oswald in the cafeteria of the Texas Book Depository at a time too close to get back up to the sixth floor from where at least some of the three bullets were fired. And three, Oswald's behavior after the assassination just makes no sense from someone trying to get away from the scene of this horrible crime that he had just supposedly committed. Now, these details added to what we heard in earlier podcast episodes about why some highly placed people at the CIA, and actually I keep saying, you know, the CIA, it wasn't the entire CIA, It was James Jesus Angleton and a couple of other very highly placed and powerful people at the CIA who wanted to kill Kennedy and the mafia and the Cuban exiles, why they wanted to see JFK dead. Plus the forensic evidence of at least one of the three bullets coming from in front of the JFK limousine that is not from the Texas Book Depository where Oswald was. That is in back of the limousine. Well, all of that makes the case that if I were on a jury trying Oswald for this crime, I'd have more than enough evidence or lack of evidence to find him not guilty. But, of course, as we know, Oswald never got to trial because Jack Ruby killed him. So Oswald turned out not to be just a patsy, a troubled but innocent man blamed for the assassination of John F. Kennedy, but a patsy who paid for that role with his life. And in the next podcast, episode nine, which will be on tomorrow, and I'll be reviewing that at episode 10 in the weeks ahead, We'll find out more about Jack Ruby's role in all of this. And as I've said before, I do hope that by the end of these riveting podcast episodes, we learn why the president's brother, Robert F. Kennedy, put up with all of this, only to be 
assassinated later in that same decade, the 1960s, himself. The Light on Light Through podcast. And I hope you enjoyed my review of episode six through eight of the Who Killed JFK podcast. As I said, I will be back here in a couple of weeks with my review of the concluding episodes of this crucially important podcast. I think anyone who's ever had a question, who's ever doubted the Wire Commission report and is still wondering who killed John F. Kennedy, this podcast is must listening. And I'll be back here next week with a review or an interview on some other topic. Let me wish all of you a happy new year. Today is January 2nd, 2024. And until I'm back here with the next episode of Light on Light Through next week, stay well, stay sound, and keep doing whatever you can to help the people of Israel and Ukraine fight off the terrorists and fascists who invaded their countries. The Light on Light Through podcast. Athens, 2042 AD. She ripped the paper in half, then ripped the halves, then ripped what was left again into bits and pieces of history that could have been. Sierra Waters had read once that, years ago, it was thought that men made love for the thrill, while women made love for the sense of connection it gave them. Curled up with a good book says, Sierra Waters is sexy as hell. You can find out more about The Plot to Save Socrates by Paul Levinson at theplottosavesocrates.com. Paul Levinson still codes about an ancient biotech war raging on in secret for centuries. Well, one day after a congressional committee pursuant to that act was established,